The Roman Empire was one of the largest and most powerful empires in history, spanning a period of more than 500 years from 27 BCE to 476 CE. The empire was founded by Augustus, the first Roman emperor, who ended the Roman Republic and established a system of government that would endure for centuries. Under the Roman Empire, Rome continued to expand its territory through military conquest, and at its height, it controlled much of Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. The empire was known for its sophisticated legal system, advanced engineering and architecture, and influential cultural achievements. During the first two centuries of the Roman Empire, known as the Pax Romana, or, Roman Peace, the empire experienced a period of relative stability and prosperity. The economy flourished, and the empire was marked by significant cultural and artistic achievements, including the construction of monumental structures such as the Colosseum and the Pantheon. However, the later years of the empire were marked by political instability, economic decline, and military challenges from foreign invaders. In the 3rd century CE, the empire was beset by a series of crises, including civil war, invasion by barbarian tribes, and economic collapse. Despite attempts to reform the empire, including the establishment of the Tetrarchy, a system of joint rule by four emperors, the empire continued to decline. In 476 CE, the last Western Roman emperor, Romulus Augustus, was deposed by Germanic tribes, marking the end of the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire, known as the Byzantine Empire, continued to exist for another thousand years until it was conquered by the Ottoman Turks in 1453. The legacy of the Roman Empire can be seen in modern Western culture, from its system of government to its language, literature, and architecture. The founding of Rome is a story steeped in myth and legend. According to tradition, Rome was founded in 753 BCE by the twin brothers Romulus and Remus. The brothers were said to have been abandoned as infants and raised by a she-wolf in a cave on Palatine Hill, one of the seven hills on which Rome was built. As adults, Romulus and Remus decided to establish a city on the site where they had been raised. However, they could not agree on the exact location of the city, and a dispute arose between them. In the ensuing conflict, Romulus killed Remus and became the sole ruler of the new city, which he named after himself. The story of Romulus and Remus is just one of several legends associated with the founding of Rome. Another popular myth involves the Trojan prince Aeneas, who was said to have fled the city of Troy after it was sacked by the Greeks. According to tradition, Aeneas eventually landed in Italy and founded the city of Lavinium, which was the predecessor to Rome. Historians believe that the actual founding of Rome was a much more gradual process, and that the city grew over time through a series of alliances and conquests. The earliest inhabitants of the area were likely the Latins, an Indo-European people who established a settlement on the Palatine Hill around the 10th century BCE. Over time, the Latins were joined by other groups, including the Sabines and the Etruscans. According to tradition, the Etruscan king Tarquin the Proud was the last king of Rome, and was overthrown in 509 BCE by a group of aristocrats who established the Roman Republic. Despite the uncertain origins of Rome, the city went on to become one of the most powerful and influential civilizations in history. Its legacy can be seen in modern-day Western culture, from its system of government to its language, art, and architecture. The Roman Republic was the period of ancient Roman history that began in 509 BCE, when a group of aristocrats overthrew the Etruscan king Tarquin the Proud, and established a system of government that was based on a complex set of checks and balances. Under the Roman Republic, the government was led by two consuls, who were elected annually by the people. The consuls were responsible for leading the Roman army, administering justice, and presiding over the Senate, a body of 300 wealthy citizens who served as the advisory council to the consuls. The Roman Republic was marked by a series of conquests and expansions, as Rome gradually extended its territory through military conquest and alliances with neighboring states. During this time, Rome established itself as a major power in the Mediterranean world, and became embroiled in a series of wars with other powerful states, including Carthage. The Republic was also marked by a series of political struggles between the patrician class, the wealthy and powerful families who controlled the government, and the plebeian class, the lower classes of society who were excluded from political power. The plebeians eventually gained greater political representation through the creation of a popular assembly, which had the power to pass laws and elect officials. Despite its many achievements, 
The Roman Republic was marked by social and economic inequality, and its system of government was often characterized by corruption and abuse of power. The Republic ultimately fell into decline as a result of a series of crises, including the assassination of Julius Caesar, the civil wars that followed, and the rise of military strongmen such as Pompey and Caesar. In 27 BCE, Augustus, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, became the first Roman Emperor, bringing an end to the Roman Republic and ushering in the period of the Roman Empire. Nonetheless, the legacy of the Roman Republic can still be seen in modern Western political thought, particularly in the concepts of representative government, constitutionalism, and the rule of law. The Punic Wars were a series of three wars fought between Rome and Carthage, which lasted from 264 BCE to 146 BCE. The wars were fought for control of the Mediterranean, and were some of the largest and most significant conflicts in ancient history. The First Punic War, 264-241 BCE, began when Rome and Carthage both sought to control the island of Sicily. The war was mainly fought at sea, and the Romans were able to develop a navy capable of challenging the Carthaginians, ultimately winning the war and gaining control of Sicily. The Second Punic War, 218 to 201 BCE, was fought after the Carthaginian general Hannibal invaded Italy with a large army, crossing the Alps with elephants. Hannibal won several major battles, including the Battle of Cannae, but was ultimately defeated by Rome under the leadership of Scipio Africanus, who invaded North Africa and defeated the Carthaginians at the Battle of Zama. The Third Punic War, 149 to 146 BCE, was fought after Rome accused Carthage of breaking a peace treaty and declared war. The Romans laid siege to Carthage for three years, ultimately sacking the city and enslaving its population, effectively ending Carthaginian power in the Mediterranean. The Punic Wars had a significant impact on both Rome and Carthage. For Rome, the war solidified its position as the dominant power in the Mediterranean world and established it as a major military power. For Carthage, the wars marked the end of its power and influence, and its destruction left a power vacuum in the Mediterranean that was eventually filled by Rome. The Punic Wars also had broader implications for the ancient world, contributing to the decline of Greek power and influence, and paving the way for the emergence of the Roman Empire as a dominant force in the Western world. Gaius Julius Caesar 100 BC 44 BC was a Roman general and statesman. A member of the First Triumvirate, Caesar led the Roman armies in the Gallic Wars before defeating his political rival Pompey in a civil war, and subsequently became dictator from 49 BC until his assassination in 44 BC. He played a critical role in the events that led to the demise of the Roman Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire. In 60 BC, Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey formed the First Triumvirate, an informal political alliance that dominated Roman politics for several years. Their attempts to amass power as populares were opposed by the Optimates within the Roman Senate, among them Cato the Younger with the frequent support of Cicero. Caesar rose to become one of the most powerful politicians in the Roman Republic through a string of military victories in the Gallic Wars, completed by 51 BC, which greatly extended Roman territory. During this time he both invaded Britain and built a bridge across the Rhine River. These achievements and the support of his veteran army threatened to eclipse the standing of Pompey, who had realigned himself with the Senate after the death of Crassus in 53 BC. With the Gallic Wars concluded, the Senate ordered Caesar to step down from his military command and return to Rome. In 49 BC, Caesar openly defied the Senate's authority by crossing the Rubicon and marching towards Rome at the head of an army. This began Caesar's civil war, which he won, leaving him in a position of near-unchallenged power and influence in 45 BC. After assuming control of government, Caesar began a program of social and governmental reforms, including the creation of the Julian calendar. 
he gave citizenship to many residents of far regions of the Roman Republic. He initiated land reform and support for veterans. He centralized the bureaucracy of the Republic and was eventually proclaimed, dictator for life, dictator perpetua. His populist and authoritarian reforms angered the elites, who began to conspire against him. On the Ides of March, the 15th of March, 44 BC, Caesar was assassinated by a group of rebellious senators led by Brutus and Cassius, who stabbed him to death. A new series of civil wars broke out and the constitutional government of the Republic was never fully restored. Caesar's great-nephew and adopted heir Octavian, later known as Augustus, rose to sole power after defeating his opponents in the last civil war of the Roman Republic. Octavian set about solidifying his power, and the era of the Roman Empire began. Caesar was an accomplished author and historian as well as a statesman. Much of his life is known from his own accounts of his military campaigns. Other contemporary sources include the letters and speeches of Cicero and the historical writings of Sallust. Later biographies of Caesar by Suetonius and Plutarch are also important sources. Caesar is considered by many historians to be one of the greatest military commanders in history. His cognomen was subsequently adopted as a synonym for emperor. The title, Caesar, was used throughout the Roman Empire, giving rise to modern descendants such as Kaiser and Tsar. He has frequently appeared in literary and artistic works, and his political philosophy, known as Caesarism, has inspired politicians into the modern era. Early Life and Career of Julius Caesar Gaius Julius Caesar was born into a patrician family, the Gens Julia, which claimed descent from Julius, son of the legendary Trojan prince Aeneas, supposedly the son of the goddess Venus. The Julii were of Alban origin, mentioned as one of the leading Alban houses, which settled in Rome around the mid-7th century BC, following the destruction of Alba Longa. They were granted patrician status, along with other noble Alban families. The Julii also existed at an early period at Beauvale, evidenced by a very ancient inscription on an altar in the theater of that town, which speaks of their offering sacrifices according to the Lege Albana, or Alban Rites. Despite their ancient pedigree, the Julii Caesars were not especially politically influential, although they had enjoyed some revival of their political fortunes in the early 1st century BC, Caesar's father. His mother, Aurelia, came from an influential family, Little is recorded of Caesar's childhood. In 85 BC, Caesar's father died suddenly, making Caesar the head of the family at the age of 16. His coming of age coincided with the civil wars of his uncle Gaius Marius and his rival Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Both sides carried out bloody purges of their political opponents whenever they were in the ascendancy. Marius and his ally Lucius Cornelius Cinna were in control of the city when Caesar was nominated as the new Flamen Dialis, high priest of Jupiter, and he was married to Cinna's daughter Cornelia. Following Sulla's final victory, however, Caesar's connections to the old regime made him a target for the new one. He was stripped of his inheritance, his wife's dowry, and his priesthood but he refused to divorce Cornelia and was instead forced to go into hiding. The threat against him was lifted by the intervention of his mother's family, which included supporters of Sulla and the Vestal Virgins. Sulla gave in reluctantly and is said to have declared that he saw many a Marius in Caesar. The loss of his priesthood had allowed him to pursue a military career 
as the high priest of Jupiter was not permitted to touch a horse, sleep three nights outside his own bed or one night outside Rome, or look upon an army. Caesar felt that it would be safer to be far away should Sulla change his mind, so he left Rome and joined the army, serving under Marcus Minucius Thermus in Asia and Servilius Isauricus in Cilicia. He served with distinction, winning the civic crown for his part in the siege of Mytilene. He went on a mission to Bithynia to secure the assistance of King Nicomedes's fleet, but he spent so long at Nicomedes' court that rumors arose of an affair with the king, which Caesar vehemently denied for the rest of his life. Hearing of Sulla's death in 78 BC, Caesar felt safe enough to return to Rome. He lacked means since his inheritance was confiscated, but he acquired a modest house in Sabura, a lower-class neighborhood of Rome. He turned to legal advocacy and became known for his exceptional oratory accompanied by impassioned gestures and a high-pitched voice, and ruthless prosecution of former governors notorious for extortion and corruption. Dictator Lucius Cornelius Sulla stripped Caesar of the priesthood. On the way across the Aegean Sea, Caesar was captured by pirates and held prisoner. He maintained an attitude of superiority throughout his captivity. The pirates demanded a ransom of 20 talents of silver, but he insisted that they ask for 50. Caesar was relaxed and familiar with his captors, and, seemingly, joked that after his release he would raise a fleet, pursue and capture the pirates, and crucify them while alive. After his ransom was paid, he fulfilled this promise in full, apart from one detail, as a sign of leniency, he first had their throats cut. He was soon called back into military action in Asia, raising a band of auxiliaries to repel an incursion from the east. On his return to Rome, he was elected military tribune, a first step in a political career. He was elected quaestor in 69 BC, and during that year he delivered the funeral oration for his aunt Julia including images of her husband Marius, unseen since the days of Sulla, in the funeral procession. His wife Cornelia also died that year. Caesar went to serve his quaestorship in Hispania after his wife's funeral, in the spring or early summer of 69 BC. While there, he is said to have encountered a statue of Alexander the Great, and realized with dissatisfaction that he was now at an age when Alexander had the world at his feet, while he had achieved comparatively little. On his return in 67 BC, he married Pompeia, a granddaughter of Sulla, whom he later divorced in 61 BC after her embroilment in the Bonadilla scandal. In 65 BC, he was elected Curule Aedile, and staged lavish games that won him further attention and popular support. In 63 BC, he ran for election to the post of Pontifex Maximus, chief priest of the Roman state religion. He ran against two powerful senators. Accusations of bribery were made by all sides. Caesar won comfortably, despite his opponent's greater experience and standing. Cicero was consul that year, and he exposed Catalan's conspiracy to seize control of the Republic. Several senators accused Caesar of involvement in the plot. After serving as praetor in 62 BC, Caesar was appointed to govern Hispania Ulterior, the western part of the Iberian Peninsula, as propraetor though some sources suggest that he held proconsular powers. He was still in considerable debt and needed to satisfy his creditors before he could leave. He turned to Marcus Licinius Crassus, the richest man in Rome. Crassus paid some of Caesar's debts and acted as guarantor for others, in return for political support in his opposition to the interests of Pompey. Even so, to avoid becoming a private citizen and thus open to prosecution for his debts, Caesar left for his province before his praetorship had ended. In Hispania, he conquered two local tribes and was hailed as imperator by his troops. He reformed the law regarding debts, and completed his governorship in high esteem. Caesar was acclaimed imperator in 60 BC, and again later in 45 BC. In the Roman Republic, this was an honorary title assumed by certain military commanders. After an especially great victory, army troops in the field would proclaim their commander imperator, an acclamation necessary for a general to apply to the senate for a triumph. However, Caesar also wished to stand for consul, the most senior magistracy in the republic. If he were to celebrate a triumph, 
he would have to remain a soldier and stay outside the city until the ceremony, but to stand for election he would need to lay down his command and enter Rome as a private citizen. He could not do both in the time available. He asked the Senate for permission to stand in absentia, but Cato blocked the proposal. Faced with the choice between a triumph and the consulship, Caesar chose the consulship. First consulship, first triumvirate, military campaigns. In 60 BC, Caesar sought election as consul for 59 BC, along with two other candidates. The election was sorted. Even Cato, with his reputation for incorruptibility, is said to have resorted to bribery in favor of one of Caesar's opponents. Caesar won, along with conservative Marcus Bibulus. First Triumvirate Caesar was already in Marcus Licinius Crassus' political debt, but he also made overtures to Pompey. Pompey and Crassus had been at odds for a decade, so Caesar tried to reconcile them. The three of them had enough money and political influence to control public business. This informal alliance, known as the First Triumvirate, rule of three men, was cemented by the marriage of Pompey to Caesar's daughter Julia. Caesar also married again, this time Calpurnia, who was the daughter of another powerful senator. Caesar proposed a law for redistributing public lands to the poor, by force of arms, if need be, a proposal supported by Pompey and by Crassus, making the Triumvirate public. Pompey filled the city with soldiers, a move which intimidated the Triumvirate's opponents. Bibulus attempted to declare the omens unfavorable and thus void the new law, but he was driven from the forum by Caesar's armed supporters. Bibulus's lictors had their fasces broken, two high magistrates accompanying him were wounded, and he had a bucket of excrement thrown over him. In fear of his life, he retired to his house for the rest of the year, issuing occasional proclamations of bad omens. These attempts proved ineffective in obstructing Caesar's legislation. Roman satirists ever after referred to the year as, the consulship of Julius and Caesar. When Caesar was first elected, the aristocracy tried to limit his future power by allotting the woods and pastures of Italy, rather than the governorship of a province, as his military command duty after his year in office was over. With the help of political allies, Caesar secured passage of the Lex Vitinia, granting him governorship over Cisalpine Gaul, northern Italy, and Illyricum, northwest Balkans. At the instigation of Pompey and his father-in-law Piso, Transalpine Gaul, southern France, was added later after the untimely death of its governor, giving him command of four legions. The term of his governorship, and thus his immunity from prosecution, was set at five years, rather than the usual one. When his consulship ended, Caesar narrowly avoided prosecution for the irregularities of his year in office, and quickly left for his province. Conquest of Gaul Caesar was still deeply in debt, but there was money to be made as a governor, whether by extortion or by military adventurism. Caesar had four legions under his command, two of his provinces bordered on unconquered territory, and parts of Gaul were known to be unstable. Some of Rome's Gallic allies had been defeated by their rivals at the Battle of Magadabriga, with the help of a contingent of Germanic tribes. The Romans feared these tribes were preparing to migrate south, closer to Italy, and that they had warlike intent. Caesar raised two new legions and defeated these tribes. In response to Caesar's earlier activities, the tribes in the northeast began to arm themselves. Caesar treated this as an aggressive move and, after an inconclusive engagement against the united tribes, he conquered the tribes piecemeal. Meanwhile, one of his legions began the conquest of the tribes in the far north, directly opposite Britain. During the spring of 56 BC, the Triumvirs held a conference, as Rome was in turmoil and Caesar's political alliance was coming undone. The Lucca Conference renewed the first triumvirate and extended Caesar's governorship for another five years. The conquest of the north was soon completed, while a few pockets of resistance remained. Caesar now had a secure base from which to launch an invasion of Britain. In 55 BC, Caesar repelled an incursion into Gaul by two Germanic tribes, and followed it up by building a bridge across the Rhine and making a show of force in Germanic territory, before returning and dismantling the bridge. Late that summer, having subdued two other tribes, he crossed into Britain, claiming that the Britons had aided one of his enemies the previous year, possibly the Veneti of Brittany. His knowledge of Britain was poor, and although he gained a beachhead on the coast, he could not advance further. He raided out from his beachhead and destroyed some villages, then returned to Gaul for the winter. He returned the following year, better prepared and with a larger force, and achieved more. 
He advanced inland and established a few alliances, but poor harvests led to widespread revolt in Gaul, forcing Caesar to leave Britain for the last time. Though the Gallic tribes were just as strong as the Romans militarily, the internal division among the Gauls guaranteed an easy victory for Caesar. Vercingetorix's attempt in 52 BC to unite them against Roman invasion came too late. He proved an astute commander, defeating Caesar at the Battle of Gergovia, but Caesar's elaborate siege works at the Battle of Alesia finally forced his surrender. Despite scattered outbreaks of warfare the following year, Gaul was effectively conquered. Plutarch claimed that during the Gallic Wars the army had fought against three million men, of whom one million died, and another million were enslaved, subjugated 300 tribes, and destroyed 800 cities. The casualty figures are disputed by modern historians. Civil War While Caesar was in Britain, his daughter Julia, Pompey's wife, had died in childbirth. Caesar tried to re-secure Pompey's support by offering him his great niece in marriage, but Pompey declined. In 53 BC, Crassus was killed leading a failed invasion of Parthia. Due to uncontrolled political violence in the city, Pompey was appointed sole consul in 52 as an emergency measure. That year, a law of the ten tribunes was passed, giving Caesar the right to stand for a consulship in absentia. From the period 52 to 49 BC, trust between Caesar and Pompey disintegrated. In 51 BC, the consul Marcellus proposed recalling Caesar, arguing that his provincia, here meaning task, due to his victory in Gaul was complete. The proposal was vetoed. That year, it seemed that the conservatives around Cato in the Senate would seek to enlist Pompey to force Caesar to return from Gaul without honors or a second consulship. Pompey, however, at the time intended to go to Spain. Cato, Bibulus, and their allies, however, were successful in winning Pompey over to take a hard line against Caesar's continued command. As 50 BC progressed, fears of civil war grew. Both Caesar and his opponents started building up troops in southern Gaul and northern Italy, respectively. In the autumn, Cicero and others sought disarmament by both Caesar and Pompey, and on 1 December 50 BC this was formally proposed in the Senate. It received overwhelming support 370 to 22 but was not passed when one of the consuls dissolved the Senate meeting. At the start of 49 BC, Caesar's renewed offer that he and Pompey disarm was read to the Senate, which was rejected by the hardliners. A later compromise given privately to Pompey was also rejected at their insistence. On 7 January, his supportive tribunes were driven from Rome. The Senate then declared Caesar an enemy and it issued its Senatus Consultum Ultimum. There is scholarly disagreement as to the specific reasons why Caesar marched on Rome. A popular theory is that Caesar was in a position where he was forced to choose between prosecution and exile or civil war. Whether Caesar actually would have been prosecuted and convicted is debated. Some scholars believe the possibility of successful prosecution was extremely unlikely. Caesar's main objectives were to secure a second consulship and a triumph. He feared that his opponents, then holding both consulships for 50 BC, would reject his candidacy or refuse to ratify an election he won. This also was the core of his war justification. That Pompey and his allies were planning, by force if necessary, indicated in the expulsion of the tribunes, to suppress the liberty of the Roman people to elect Caesar and honor his accomplishments. Around 10 or the 11th of January 49 BC, in response to the Senate's final decree, Caesar crossed the Rubicon, the river defining the northern boundary of Italy, with a single legion, the Legio 13 Gemina, and ignited civil war. Upon crossing the Rubicon, Caesar, according to Plutarch and Suetonius, is supposed to have quoted the Athenian playwright Menander, in Greek, the die is cast. Erasmus, however, notes that the more accurate Latin translation of the Greek imperative mood would be, Alia Iacta Esto, let the die be cast. Pompey and many senators fled south, believing that Caesar was marching quickly for Rome. Caesar, after capturing communication routes to Rome, paused and opened negotiations, but they fell apart amid mutual distrust. Caesar responded by advancing south, seeking to capture Pompey to force a conference. Pompey escaped Italy from Brundisium before Caesar could capture him. Heading for Hispania, Caesar left Italy under the control of Mark Antony. After an astonishing 27-day march, Caesar defeated Pompey's lieutenants, then returned east, to challenge Pompey in Illyria, where, on 10 July 48 BC in the Battle of Dyrrhachium, Caesar barely avoided a catastrophic defeat. 
In an exceedingly short engagement later that year, he decisively defeated Pompey at Pharsalus, Greece, on 9 August 48 BC. In Rome, Caesar was appointed dictator, with Antony as his master of the horse, second in command. Caesar presided over his own election to a second consulship and then, after 11 days, resigned this dictatorship. Caesar pursued Pompey to Egypt, arriving soon after Pompey was assassinated. There, Caesar was presented with Pompey's severed head and seal ring, and received them with tears. He had Pompey's assassins put to death. Caesar then became involved with an Egyptian civil war between the child pharaoh Ptolemy XIII, Theos Philopator and Cleopatra, his sister, wife, and co-regent queen. Perhaps as a result of the pharaoh's role in Pompey's murder, Caesar sided with Cleopatra. When Caesar returned to Rome, the Senate granted him triumphs for his victories, ostensibly those over Gaul, Egypt, Pharnaces, and Juba, rather than over his Roman opponents. When Arsinoe IV, Egypt's former queen, was paraded in chains, the spectators admired her dignified bearing and were moved to pity. Triumphal games were held, with beast hunts involving 400 lions and gladiator contests. A naval battle was held on a flooded basin at the Field of Mars. At the Circus Maximus, two armies of war captives, each of 2,000 people, 200 horses, and 20 elephants, fought to the death. Again, some bystanders complained, this time at Caesar's wasteful extravagance. A riot broke out, and stopped only when Caesar had two rioters sacrificed by the priests on the field of Mars. After the triumph, Caesar set out to pass an ambitious legislative agenda. He ordered a census be taken, which forced a reduction in the grain dole, and decreed that jurors could come only from the Senate or the equestrian ranks. He passed a sumptuary law that restricted the purchase of certain luxuries. After this, he passed a law that rewarded families for having many children, to speed up the repopulation of Italy. Then, he outlawed professional guilds, except those of ancient foundation, since many of these were subversive political clubs. He then passed a term limit law applicable to governors. He passed a debt restructuring law, which ultimately eliminated about a fourth of all debts owed. The Forum of Caesar, with its Temple of Venus Genetrix, was then built, among many other public works. Caesar also tightly regulated the purchase of state-subsidized grain and reduced the number of recipients to a fixed number, all of whom were entered into a special register. From 47 to 44 BC, he made plans for the distribution of land to about 15,000 of his veterans. The most important change, however, was his reform of the Roman calendar. The calendar at the time was regulated by the movement of the moon. By replacing it with the Egyptian calendar, based on the sun, Roman farmers were able to use it as the basis of consistent seasonal planting from year to year. He set the length of the year to 365.25 days by adding an intercalary leap day at the end of February every fourth year. To bring the calendar into alignment with the seasons, he decreed that three extra months be inserted into 46 BC, the ordinary intercalary month at the end of February, and two extra months after November. Thus, the Julian calendar opened on 1 January 45 BC. This calendar is almost identical to the current Western calendar. Shortly before his assassination, he passed a few more reforms. He appointed officials to carry out his land reforms and ordered the rebuilding of Carthage and Corinth. He also extended Latin rites throughout the Roman world, and then abolished the tax system and reverted to the earlier version that allowed cities to collect tribute however they wanted, rather than needing Roman intermediaries. His assassination prevented further and larger schemes, which included the construction of an unprecedented temple to Mars, a huge theater, and a library on the scale of the Library of Alexandria. He also wanted to convert Ostia to a major port, and cut a canal through the Isthmus of Corinth. Militarily, he wanted to conquer the Dacians and Parthians, and avenge the loss at Carhe. Thus, he instituted a massive mobilization. Shortly before his assassination, the Senate named him censor for life and pater patriae, father of the country, and the month of Quintilis was renamed July in his honor. He was granted further honors, which were later used to justify his assassination as a would-be divine monarch. Coins were issued bearing his image and his statue was placed next to those of the kings. He was granted a golden chair in the Senate, was allowed to wear triumphal dress whenever he chose, and was offered a form of semi-official or popular cult, with Antony as his high priest. 
He withstood the siege of Alexandria and later he defeated the pharaoh's forces at the Battle of the Nile in 47 BC, installing Cleopatra as ruler. Caesar and Cleopatra celebrated their victory with a triumphal procession on the Nile in the spring of 47 BC. The royal barge was accompanied by 400 additional ships, and Caesar was introduced to the luxurious lifestyle of the Egyptian pharaohs. Caesar and Cleopatra were not married. Caesar continued his relationship with Cleopatra throughout his last marriage, in Roman eyes, this did not constitute adultery, and probably fathered a son called Caesarian. Cleopatra visited Rome on more than one occasion, residing in Caesar's villa just outside Rome across the Tiber. Late in 48 BC, Caesar was again appointed dictator, with a term of one year. After spending the first months of 47 BC in Egypt, Caesar went to the Middle East, where he annihilated the king of Pontus, his victory was so swift and complete that he mocked Pompey's previous victories over such poor enemies. On his way to Pontus, Caesar visited Tarsus from 27 to the 29th of May 47 BC, where he met enthusiastic support, but where, according to Cicero, Cassius was planning to kill him at this point. Thence, he proceeded to Africa to deal with the remnants of Pompey's senatorial supporters. He was defeated by Titus Labianus at Ruspina on 4 January 46 BC but recovered to gain a significant victory at Thapsus on 6 April 46 BC over Cato, who then committed suicide. After this victory, he was appointed dictator for ten years. Pompey's sons escaped to Hispania. Caesar gave chase and defeated the last remnants of opposition in the Battle of Munda in March 45 BC. During this time, Caesar was elected to his third and fourth terms as consul in 46 BC and 45 BC, this last time without a colleague. Dictatorship and Assassination While he was still campaigning in Hispania, the Senate began bestowing honors on Caesar. Caesar had not proscribed his enemies, instead pardoning almost all, and there was no serious public opposition to him. Great games and celebrations were held in April to honor Caesar's victory at Munda. Plutarch writes that many Romans found the triumph held following Caesar's victory to be in poor taste, as those defeated in the civil war had not been foreigners, but instead fellow Romans. Plutarch writes that many Romans found the triumph held following Caesar's victory to be in poor taste, as those defeated in the civil war had not been foreigners, but instead fellow Romans. On Caesar's return to Italy in September 45 BC, he filed his will, naming his grandnephew Gaius Octavius, Octavian, later known as Augustus Caesar, as his principal heir, leaving his vast estate and property including his name. Caesar also wrote that if Octavian died before Caesar did, Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus would be the next heir in succession. In his will, he also left a substantial gift to the citizens of Rome, between his crossing of the Rubicon in 49 BC, and his assassination in 44 BC. Caesar established a new constitution, which was intended to accomplish three separate goals. First, he wanted to suppress all armed resistance out in the provinces, and thus bring order back to the Republic. Second, he wanted to create a strong central government in Rome. Finally, he wanted to knit together all of the provinces into a single cohesive unit. The first goal was accomplished when Caesar defeated Pompey and his supporters. To accomplish the other two goals, he needed to ensure that his control over the government was undisputed, so he assumed these powers by increasing his own authority, and by decreasing the authority of Rome's other political institutions. Finally, he enacted a series of reforms that were meant to address several long-neglected issues, the most important of which was his reform of the calendar, political reforms. The history of Caesar's political appointments is complex and uncertain. Caesar held both the dictatorship and the tribunate, but alternated between the consulship and the proconsulship. His powers within the state seem to have rested upon these magistracies. He was first appointed dictator in 49 BC, possibly to preside over elections, but resigned his dictatorship within 11 days. In 48 BC, he was reappointed dictator, only this time for an indefinite period, and in 46 BC, he was appointed dictator for 10 years. In 48 BC, Caesar was given permanent tribunician powers, which made his person sacrosanct and allowed him to veto the Senate, although on at least one occasion, tribunes did attempt to obstruct him. The offending tribunes in this case were brought before the Senate and divested of their office. This was not the first time Caesar had violated a tribune's sacrosanctity. 
After he had first marched on Rome in 49 BC, he forcibly opened the treasury, although a tribune had the seal placed on it. After the impeachment of the two obstructive tribunes, Caesar, perhaps unsurprisingly, faced no further opposition from other members of the Tribunician College. When Caesar returned to Rome in 47 BC, the ranks of the Senate had been severely depleted, so he used his censorial powers to appoint many new senators, which eventually raised the Senate's membership to 900. All the appointments were of his own partisans, which robbed the senatorial aristocracy of its prestige and made the Senate increasingly subservient to him. To minimize the risk that another general might attempt to challenge him, Caesar passed a law that subjected governors to term limits. In 46 BC, Caesar gave himself the title of Prefect of the Morals, which was an office that was new only in name, as its powers were identical to those of the censors. Thus, he could hold censorial powers, while technically not subjecting himself to the same checks to which the ordinary censors were subject, and he used these powers to fill the Senate with his own partisans. He also set the precedent, which his imperial successors followed, of requiring the Senate to bestow various titles and honors upon him. He was, for example, given the title of Pater Patriae and Imperator. Coins bore his likeness, and he was given the right to speak first during Senate meetings. Caesar then increased the number of magistrates who were elected each year, which created a large pool of experienced magistrates and allowed Caesar to reward his supporters. Caesar even took steps to transform Italy into a Roman province and to link more tightly the other provinces of the empire into a single cohesive unit. This process, of fusing the entire Roman Empire into a single unit, rather than maintaining it as a network of unequal principalities, would ultimately be completed by Caesar's successor, the Emperor Augustus. In October 45 BC, Caesar resigned his position as sole consul and facilitated the election of two successors for the remainder of the year, which theoretically restored the ordinary consulship, since the constitution did not recognize a single consul without a colleague. In February 44 BC, one month before his assassination, he was appointed dictator in perpetuity. Under Caesar, a significant amount of authority was vested in his lieutenants, mostly because Caesar was frequently out of Italy. Near the end of his life, Caesar began to prepare for a war against the Parthian Empire. Since his absence from Rome might limit his ability to install his own consuls, he passed a law which allowed him to appoint all magistrates and all consuls and tribunes. This, in effect, transformed the magistrates from being representatives of the people to being representatives of Caesar. Assassination On the Ides of March, the 15th of March, see Roman calendar, of 44 BC, Caesar was due to appear at a session of the Senate. Several senators had conspired to assassinate Caesar. Mark Antony, having vaguely learned of the plot the night before from a terrified liberator named Servilius Casca, and fearing the worst, went to head Caesar off. The plotters, however, had anticipated this and, fearing that Antony would come to Caesar's aid, had arranged for Trebonius to intercept him just as he approached the portico of the Theatre of Pompey, where the session was to be held, and detain him outside. Plutarch, however, assigns this action of delaying Antony to Brutus Albinus. When he heard the commotion from the Senate chamber, Antony fled. According to Plutarch, as Caesar arrived at the Senate, Tilius Cimber presented him with a petition to recall his exiled brother. The other conspirators crowded round to offer support. Both Plutarch and Suetonius say that Caesar waved him away, but Cimber grabbed his shoulders and pulled down Caesar's toga. Caesar then cried to Cimber, Why, this is violence. Casca simultaneously produced his dagger and made a glancing thrust at Caesar's neck. Caesar turned around quickly and caught Casca by the arm. According to Plutarch, he said in Latin, Casca, you villain, what are you doing? Casca, frightened, shouted, help, brother. Only its altar now remains. A life-size wax statue of Caesar was later erected in the forum displaying the 23 stab wounds. In the chaos following the death of Caesar, Antony, Octavian, later Augustus Caesar, and others fought a series of five civil wars, which would culminate in the formation of the Roman Empire. Aftermath of the Assassination The result, unforeseen by the assassins, was that Caesar's death precipitated the end of the Roman Republic. The Roman middle and lower classes, with whom Caesar was immensely popular and had been since before Gaul, became enraged that a small group of aristocrats had killed their champion. Antony, who had been drifting apart from Caesar, 
capitalized on the grief of the Roman mob and threatened to unleash them on the Optimates, perhaps with the intent of taking control of Rome himself. To his surprise and chagrin, Caesar had named his grandnephew Gaius Octavius his sole heir, bequeathing him the immensely potent Caesar name and making him one of the wealthiest citizens in the Republic. The crowd at the funeral boiled over, throwing dry branches, furniture, and even clothing on to Caesar's funeral pyre, causing the flames to spin out of control, seriously damaging the forum. The mob then attacked the houses of Brutus and Cassius, where they were repelled only with considerable difficulty, ultimately providing the spark for the civil war, fulfilling at least in part Antony's threat against the aristocrats. Antony did not foresee the ultimate outcome of the next series of civil wars, particularly with regard to Caesar's adopted heir. Octavian, aged only 18 when Caesar died, proved to have considerable political skills, and while Antony dealt with Decimus Brutus in the first round of the new civil wars, Octavian consolidated his tenuous position. To combat Brutus and Cassius, who were massing an enormous army in Greece, Antony needed soldiers, the cash from Caesar's war chests, and the legitimacy that Caesar's name would provide for any action he took against them. With the passage of the Lex Titia on the 27th of November 43 BC, the Second Triumvirate was officially formed, composed of Antony, Octavian, and Caesar's loyal cavalry commander Lepidus. It formally deified Caesar as Divus Iulius in 42 BC, and Caesar Octavian henceforth became Divi Filius, son of the Divine. Because Caesar's clemency had resulted in his murder, the Second Triumvirate reinstated the practice of proscription. It engaged in the legally sanctioned killing of a large number of its opponents to secure funding for its 45 legions in the Second Civil War against Brutus and Cassius. Antony and Octavian defeated them at Philippi. Afterward, Antony formed an alliance with Caesar's lover, Cleopatra, intending to use the fabulously wealthy Egypt as a base to dominate Rome. A third civil war broke out between Octavian on one hand and Antony and Cleopatra on the other. This final civil war, culminating in the latter's defeat at Actium in 31 BC and suicide in Egypt in 30 BC, resulted in the permanent ascendancy of Octavian, who became the first Roman emperor, under the name Caesar Augustus, a name conveying religious, rather than political, authority. Julius Caesar had been preparing to invade Parthia and Scythia, and then march back to Germania through Eastern Europe. These plans were thwarted by his assassination. His successors did attempt the conquests of Parthia and Germania, but without lasting results. Deification. Julius Caesar was the first historical Roman to be officially deified. He was posthumously granted the title Divus Julius, the divine, deified Julius, by decree of the Roman Senate on 1 January 42 BC. The appearance of a comet during games in his honor was taken as confirmation of his divinity. Though his temple was not dedicated until after his death, he may have received divine honors during his lifetime. And shortly before his assassination, Antony had been appointed as his flamen, priest. Both Octavian and Antony promoted the cult of Divus Julius. After the death of Caesar, Octavian, as the adoptive son of Caesar, assumed the title of Divi Filius, son of the divine. Personal life. Based on remarks by Plutarch, Caesar is sometimes thought to have suffered from epilepsy. Modern scholarship is sharply divided on the subject and some scholars believe that he was plagued by malaria, particularly during the sullen proscriptions of the 80s BC. Other scholars contend his epileptic seizures were due to a parasitic infection in the brain by a tapeworm. Caesar had four documented episodes of what may have been complex partial seizures. He may additionally have had absence seizures in his youth. The earliest accounts of these seizures were made by the biographer Suetonius, who was born after Caesar died. The claim of epilepsy is countered among some medical historians by a claim of hypoglycemia, which can cause epileptoid seizures. In 2003, psychiatrist Harbour F. Hodder published what he termed as the Caesar Complex Theory, arguing that Caesar was a sufferer of temporal lobe epilepsy and the debilitating symptoms of the condition were a factor in Caesar's conscious decision to forego personal safety in the days leading up to his assassination. A line from Shakespeare has sometimes been taken to mean that he was deaf in one ear. Come on my right hand, for this ear is deaf. No classical source mentions hearing impairment in connection with Caesar. The playwright may have been making metaphorical use of a passage in Plutarch that does not refer to deafness at all, but rather to a gesture Alexander of Macedon customarily made. By covering his ear, 
Alexander indicated that he had turned his attention from an accusation in order to hear the defense. Francesco M. Galassi and Hutan Ashrafian suggest that Caesar's behavioral manifestations, headaches, vertigo, falls, possibly caused by muscle weakness due to nerve damage, sensory deficit, giddiness and insensibility, and syncopal episodes were the results of cerebrovascular episodes, not epilepsy. Pliny the Elder reports in his natural history that Caesar's father and forefather died without apparent cause while putting on their shoes. These events can be more readily associated with cardiovascular complications from a stroke episode or lethal heart attack. Caesar possibly had a genetic predisposition for cardiovascular disease. Suetonius, writing more than a century after Caesar's death, describes Caesar as tall of stature with a fair complexion, shapely limbs, a somewhat full face, and keen black eyes. Name and Family Using the Latin alphabet of the period, which lacked the letters J and U, Caesar's name would be rendered G-A-I-V-S-I-V-L-I-V-S -I -I Caesar. The form C-A-I-V-S is also attested, using the older Roman representation of G by C. Young wealthy Roman boys were often taught by Greek slaves and sometimes sent to Athens for advanced training, as was Caesar's principal assassin, Brutus. In Greek, during Caesar's time, his family name was written, Kaiser, reflecting its contemporary pronunciation. Thus, his name is pronounced in a similar way to the pronunciation of the German Kaiser or Dutch Kaiser. Caesar's cognomen itself became a title. It was promulgated by the Bible, which contains the famous verse, Render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. The title became, from the late first millennium, Kaiser in German and, through Old Church Slavic Cesari, Tsar or Tsar in the Slavic languages. The last Tsar in nominal power was Simeon II of Bulgaria, whose reign ended in 1946, but is still alive in 2023. This means that for approximately 2,000 years, there was at least one head of state bearing his name. As a term for the highest ruler, the word Caesar constitutes one of the earliest. Legacy The texts written by Caesar, an autobiography of the most important events of his public life, are the most complete primary source for the reconstruction of his biography. However, Caesar wrote those texts with his political career in mind. Julius Caesar is also considered one of the first historical figures to fold his message scrolls into a concertina form, which made them easier to read. The Roman Emperor Augustus began a cult of personality of Caesar, which described Augustus as Caesar's political heir. The modern historiography is influenced by the Octavian traditions, such as when Caesar's epic is considered a turning point in the history of the Roman Empire. Still, historians try to filter the Octavian bias. Many rulers in history became interested in the historiography of Caesar. Napoleon III wrote the scholarly work Histoire de Jules César, which was not finished. The second volume listed previous rulers interested in the topic. Charles VIII ordered a monk to prepare a translation of the Gallic Wars in 1480. Charles V ordered a topographic study in France, to place the Gallic Wars in context, which created 40 high-quality maps of the conflict. The contemporary Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent catalogued the surviving editions of the commentaries, and translated them to Turkish language. Henry IV and Louis XIII of France translated the first two commentaries and the last two respectively. Louis XIV retranslated the first one afterwards. Politics Julius Caesar is seen as the main example of Caesarism, a form of political rule led by a charismatic strongman whose rule is based upon a cult of personality, whose rationale is the need to rule by force, establishing a violent social order, and being a regime involving prominence of the military in the government. Other people in history, such as the French Napoleon Bonaparte and the Italian Benito Mussolini, have defined themselves as Caesarists. Bonaparte did not focus only on Caesar's military career but also on his relation with the masses, a predecessor to populism. The word is also used in a pejorative manner by critics of this type of political rule. Roman Empire The Roman Empire was a vast and complex entity, and there is much more to its history than can be covered in a brief overview. The Roman Empire was founded in 27 BCE, when the Roman Republic fell apart and was replaced by an autocratic system of government. The first emperor, Augustus, oversaw a period of relative stability and prosperity known as the Pax Romana, during which the empire reached its peak in terms of territorial expansion and cultural influence. 
Over the centuries, the Roman Empire faced a number of challenges and crises. It experienced political instability and assassination plots, economic troubles, and military defeats. The empire's borders were constantly under threat from invading forces, and it struggled to maintain control over its vast territories. Despite these challenges, the Roman Empire was able to maintain its dominance for over 500 years. It achieved many notable accomplishments during this time, including the construction of impressive infrastructure such as roads, aqueducts, and public buildings. The empire also made significant contributions to art, literature, philosophy, and science, and its legacy has had a lasting impact on Western culture. One of the defining features of the Roman Empire was its highly organized and disciplined military. The Roman army was renowned for its efficiency, discipline, and flexibility, and it was able to conquer and control vast territories. The Romans also made significant advances in engineering and architecture, such as the construction of monumental structures like the Colosseum, which still stands in Rome today. Religion was also a significant aspect of life in the Roman Empire. The Romans were polytheistic, and they worshipped a pantheon of gods and goddesses. They also adopted many cultural practices and religious beliefs from other civilizations they conquered, such as the Greek and Egyptian cultures. As the Roman Empire entered its later years, it faced a number of internal and external pressures. Political instability, economic troubles, and military threats from outside forces contributed to the eventual decline and collapse of the empire. The Western Roman Empire fell to invading Germanic tribes in 476 CE, while the Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire, continued to thrive until its own collapse in 1453 CE. Overall, the Roman Empire was a complex and fascinating period in history, marked by impressive military conquests, cultural achievements, and contributions to human civilization. Its legacy continues to inspire and fascinate people around the world today. Pax Romana The Pax Romana was a period of relative peace and stability that lasted for approximately 200 years in the history of the Roman Empire. It began with the reign of Augustus in 27 BCE and continued until the death of Marcus Aurelius in 180 CE. During this period, the Roman Empire experienced significant growth and expansion, and its borders stretched from the Atlantic Ocean to the Middle East. The empire was characterized by its strong centralized government, efficient administration, and well-organized military. One of the key factors that contributed to the Pax Romana was the establishment of stable and effective government institutions. Augustus, the first emperor of the Roman Empire, implemented a number of reforms that helped to centralize power and create a more stable political system. He established a standing army, reorganized the Senate, and created a network of officials and administrators to oversee the empire's affairs. The Pax Romana also benefited from advances in technology and infrastructure. The Romans were known for their impressive engineering feats, including the construction of aqueducts, roads, and public buildings. These infrastructure projects helped to improve communication, transportation, and trade, and they contributed to the economic growth of the empire. Another important factor that contributed to the Pax Romana was the willingness of the Romans to accept and incorporate different cultures and religions. While the Romans were polytheistic and worshipped a pantheon of gods and goddesses, they also adopted many cultural practices and religious beliefs from other civilizations they conquered, such as the Greek and Egyptian cultures. This helped to create a sense of unity and tolerance within the empire. Despite its relative stability, the Pax Romana was not without its challenges. The empire faced external threats from invading forces, such as the Parthians and the Germanic tribes, and it also experienced internal unrest and political instability. However, the Roman Empire was able to maintain its dominance and power for over 200 years, thanks in part to the strong institutions and infrastructure that were put in place during the Pax Romana. Overall, the Pax Romana was a period of significant growth and stability in the history of the Roman Empire. It helped to create a strong and centralized government, improve infrastructure and technology, and foster a sense of unity and tolerance within the empire. Its legacy continues to be felt in Western culture today. Fall of the Roman Empire The fall of the Roman Empire is a complex and much debated topic, with no single cause or explanation. Historians generally agree that the fall of the Western Roman Empire occurred gradually over a period of several decades, rather than as a sudden and catastrophic event. One major factor that contributed to the decline of the Roman Empire was economic instability. 
The empire had long relied on conquest and the spoils of war to fund its expansion, but as the number of new territories available for conquest declined, the empire struggled to maintain its economic and military dominance. The cost of maintaining the army and the infrastructure of the empire was also a significant drain on resources. Another factor that contributed to the fall of the Roman Empire was political instability. In the late 3rd century CE, a series of military coups and civil wars plunged the empire into chaos, and weak emperors were unable to maintain control over the vast territories of the empire. This led to a breakdown in law and order, as well as increased corruption and political factionalism. Military pressures were also a contributing factor to the fall of the Roman Empire. Barbarian tribes, such as the Goths and the Huns, increasingly threatened the borders of the empire, and the Roman army was stretched thin trying to defend against these incursions. The empire was also weakened by a series of devastating plagues, which weakened the population and made it more difficult to maintain a strong military. Finally, the role of religion and cultural changes cannot be overlooked in the fall of the Roman Empire. The rise of Christianity, which became the official religion of the empire under Emperor Constantine, led to tensions and conflicts between Christians and traditional pagan worshippers. Additionally, the empire's cultural and intellectual achievements were threatened by a growing anti-intellectualism and a focus on military might and physical strength. By the 5th century CE, the Western Roman Empire had become increasingly vulnerable to external and internal pressures. In 476 CE, the last Western Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustus, was deposed by the Germanic leader Odoacer, effectively marking the end of the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire, continued to survive and thrive for several more centuries, but the fall of the Western Roman Empire marked the end of an era in Western civilization.